En teoría está grabando, pero bueno, vamos a ver. Mira, apagaba las luces cielíticas estas, las luces de campo. Vamos allá, muy bien. Y ahora si sí puedes afrontar un poquito la, el monitor hacia mí, ¿sabes? Ponerlo lo más cerca de la cabecera del paciente que puedas. Un poco más atrás, si puede ser, más separado. Ahí está, perfecto. Vale, muy bien. Está recogiendo el agua, ¿no? Está aspirando. Venga. Se está acumulando. Ok, so here we are. Another case. This is a very large prostate. A man who has uh, not have had any complication, just uh, bothersome symptoms. I don't want to force the entry into the bladder because if I do that, I will uh, probably split the, the sphincter in the midline. You see, when you force too much, it was already starting to split. So I'd rather uh, start the enucleation and then have a look at the bladder at the end. Uh, size estimation of this prostate is 160 cc. You see, it already started splitting, so I didn't want to force any more because we can, let's say, compromise sphincter function from the very beginning of the operation. Here, yeah. I'm going to mark the, the uh, landmark here. See, the sphincter is here, it's closing very nicely. I'm happy with this uh, landmark, let's say, the limitation. Huh? Here, we're going to come up to delimit the, the white line. And that's the 12 o'clock area. And this is the sphincter, huh? so despite marking the white line below the vera montanum, it's quite normal in the very large plants that we have to come this far at the apical level. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is to cut the uh, attachments of the abnormal to the stinker and uh, to try to make things easier uh, for later on in the procedure. But initially, I like to focus in the lower aspect, so from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So when we enter in the pain, we don't stretch the sphincter in this region, you know. The fact that we liberate, this generates a little bit better access towards the side. Here I'm going to use the tip of the scope to find the proper enucleation plane. That's it, I think. That's a good, good enucleation plane. Yeah. And we'll do the same thing on the on the other side. Yeah? Here, we can do a little bit mechanical uh, dissection at the beginning to make sure that we find the, the right depth of the plane. And now we will follow the white line, trying to connect both planes, both sides, and trying to establish the, so the light line of attack or the line of dissection. Here we are going to develop the posterior uh, aspect. We are using the MOSES uh, technology for this uh, operation. Uh, it provides very excellent cutting and coagulation properties and it allows us to progress 
relatively fast. And here I'm going to go a little bit closer to the Adnoma because I'm, I'm seeing that this plane is a little bit flimsy or thin. I'm going to stay a little bit closer, but I will focus on this uh, posterior plane uh, later on in the operation. I think I'm going to stop here for a moment. And then I will concentrate on liberating the apex, which is the main concern at the beginning of the procedure. Well, that's, uh, let's say, the posterior aspect. And here we come at the apical level, where I want to try to liberate the anterior apex from the sphincter. And of course, try to preserve the sphincter as, as best as I can. So here I'm going to come up with the fiber, trying to follow the white line. And I will make a cut on the prostate. Just trying to, to detach the apex from the sphincter. And then I will go and look for the good plane. The strategy to do these incisions initially will uh, help me dissect the apical lobe without damaging the sphincter. coming uh, out of the 12 o'clock area. So we have been able to detach the lateral apex let's say from the sphincter. Coming all the way up to 12 o'clock. That's 12 o'clock fibers. Now I will concentrate on the other side of the apex. Okay, this is the sphincter, this is the white line. You see how important it is to have a white line to tell you the exact location of the sphincter. And many times when you do follow up, if you haven't marked the, the location of the apex, it might be difficult to recognize where it is and you might get into trouble. So, I think this whole technique is designed to, to make it safe for the sphincter. It takes a little while to release the apex, but once the apex is released, we can uh, relax and proceed to enucleate the enoma from the capsule following this uh, circumferential uh, line of dissection, line of attack. Here I'm coming anteriorly. This is still some fibers at 12 o'clock. And let's see if we can cross towards the other side. You see, that's the other side. So we're nearly finishing the apical liberation. Continually here, of course, I don't want to take the wrong route. So I'm trying to keep the, my fiber as up as I can to remove the uh, apical tissue. Yeah, so the sphincter is already further back. So we are working in an area that has been released from the sphincter, so I'm not worrying about the sphincter anymore. And here we can cross from side to side. We'll check at the end, maybe sometimes you could leave a small amount of tissue at the apical level. It's a bleeder. We try to control it to get good visibility, but you see that the beautiful aspect of this technique is that we are irrigating a very small cavity and by irrigating this small cavity, we can have a clean view because even when there's some bleeding, as we saw before, the water is coming in and out very fast and uh, cleaning the, the media, cleaning the irrigation media, so we can perfectly see throughout this enucleation phase. Many times with our three lobe technique, uh, when you cut the middle lobe and you throw it into the bladder, if there is bleeding, the blood is going to circulate and uh, going into the bladder and then coming out. Taking it out is going to be much more difficult. So that's the...
so sometimes a piece of tissue can get on the way and block a little bit the visibility but uh, just don't pay too much attention to that if you're following the right let's say angle the right curve even when you momentarily don't see you can confidently uh, continue working of course if uh, you cannot see for a long time you should be careful and try to get better better visibility and that's the that's the light cable that went off let's go again and now i'm trying to dissect a little bit of the anterior uh, plane there's the vessel there Once the sphincter is liberated, it's important to try to uh, carry a uniform, let's say, line of dissection. If you find any resistance moving the scope, uh, step back, you know, retrieve the scope a little bit towards the apex and check what's going on. And many times, you see, uh, there is some mm, attachment that needs to be cut. And when you have a good perspective of what is going on, it's very easy to decide what to do next. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you kill, keep, uh, let's say, dissecting and dissecting and you never look back, which is a tem temptation because you get, let's say, very happy when you can progress. Uh, you might lose some information if you don't check uh, a little bit more ethical uh, what's going on. So, you know, unless you can see that everything is... Uh, going perfectly and you have no resistance, no traction, uh, it's better to, to be careful. Here we are seeing a different kind of plane, you see it's a little bit spongy, so maybe we're getting into the peripheral zone. But it looks like a good plane to me, so I'm going to follow just being a little bit more careful in that uh, area. You see that we must be now arriving to the equator of the dissection. So from now on, the angles are going to change. Yeah? We are dissecting a almost a spherical say, abnormal. And initially, the angles are opening towards the external, towards the lateral, towards the anterior, and towards the posterior. And now we need to close these angles by pointing the fiber a little bit closer to the adenoma, you see. Keep it close to the adenoma, so it dissects the plane, but it has very little chances of uh, damaging the capsule. Okay, this is a small, let's say, discrepancy in the plane. Sometimes it happens when you go from the posterior to the lateral. Many times the lateral lobe pushes laterally and the middle lobe pushes the capsule uh, downwards so in the confluence of the middle lobe and the lateral lobe there might be some uh, discrepancy in the plane it's not that you are following the wrong plane it's uh, that you are dissecting two different spaces yeah? the lateral lobe let's say uh, footprint and here you would get to the middle lobe uh, footprint. Yeah? So in between sometimes we find a discrepancy, many times you just have to cut through it to connect uh, both planes. Okay, so I think it's enough for the moment. In this side I'm going to, you see, follow the dissection circumferentially, trying to go to the other side and try to take it to a similar depth of dissection. Similar depth of dissection because we want to keep a uniform uh, progression from the apex to the bladder neck circumferentially. That's again, you see there's like a ligament here. This is what I call the ligament. This is the transition from the lower plane to the lateral plane. And sometimes when you follow this plane, it looks as if it had to go up this way, but then you go lateral and you find that there's more tissue. Yeah? So this is normal. We don't see it in the three lobe technique because actually the, the cut the side uh, five and seven of the side of the middle lobe comes exactly in this area. So it's the first time we see it when you know when we do in block 
a new creation. You know, it took a while to understand what was going on, why we would see that uh, apparent discrepancy in the in the dissection plane. So here we are also progressing towards the bladder neck. There we are. Again, follow the curve of the prostate. You know, you have to get close to the prostate so you don't uh, get into the prostatic capsule. Right here, sometimes the plane is not completely clear, but we will follow the, the shape of the prostate. It's a big land, yeah? but we are enjoying the, the excellent quality of homeostasis provided by Moses. So, gives us a lot of confidence to, to progress and to, let's say, not worry so much about hemostasis as the quality of hemostasis as we go is excellent. Yeah, this is a very good plane. Let's see what happens here. You see, you have to look back many times to check because the prostate is not a perfect sphere. Huh? And uh, sometimes you might have taken a slightly deeper plane Maybe the plane doesn't coincide totally with uh, the one you're developing, so you have to make things better and better, connect the planes when there's no natural, let's say, connection. And it's quite easy to figure out what to do, because basically what you want to do is to dissect the adenoma and, and push it into the bladder. So you want to go around it circumferentially, not very difficult understand and not very difficult to execute. Here we are. Here we are. Let's see if we enter that beautiful plane we found before here. And you see it's more or less coincides with the plane we were following down here, although the quality of the plane has changed significantly. Now maybe to me this is all abnormal, so we have to take it out. But sometimes you cannot tell. If you are taking uh, some of the peripheral some with the abnormal, it looks pretty good to me as it's going, as it's uh, progressing. Of course, here you see the fiber needs to keep really close to the abnormal, so we don't insist on the on the capsule. There we are, huh? close to the abnormal, so we don't go. into the capsule. Here, this is the area that we found at the beginning that was a little bit, looks a little bit uh, thin, so if we close to the abnormal, yeah, that looks thin too. Let's see if we can find a proper plane down here. looks very good plane so we try to follow on that on that level We're trying to you know correct a little bit the plane so we don't go too deep in that in that region we see here it looks as if this is a little bit thin uh, thin plane but by correcting uh, a little bit we will manage to to get a better plane for the continuation of the dissection of the exterior plane there we are, we're progressing quite nicely. And progressively, and as you can see, this technique is a continuous firing technique. No, you don't stop too long. You are constantly evolving, constantly dissecting the plane. And uh, that means that if you are 
able to improve the situation every minute, uh, you will end up uh, finishing the operation in a very reasonable time. When you do a uh, preload technique, you have to go back, check, look very often. Uh, so that's another advantage of this in block technique that it is very fast. You can progress really fast with it. Yeah? So that's the steer plane. We have a much better plane than we had, let's say, here, where the plane started changing direction. You see that's a little bit flimsy there. But we managed to correct the situation. All right, so now I'm going to focus on the anterior. I think we are, have done quite a lot of the posterior dissection. The plane was uh, changing direction, going up towards the bladder neck. Remember, we didn't enter the bladder in this patient before the operation because the abnoma was quite large and there was a middle lobe, so we had to push the endoscope down uh, too much. So I decided to, to start the procedure. Well, we have information about the bladder because we did a, an ultrasound before the operation. And it looked normal. And that's why I take this, uh, let's say, I think most people will try to get into the bladder to, to see what's in the bladder before starting the procedure, but I think if you have uh, ultrasound information and you can uh, start your nucleation and then uh, check uh, the bladder at the end. Here we are, that's the entry to the bladder. You can see the vertical fibers here corresponding to the landmark. Well, that's a mucosa from the bladder that is ballooning because of the water pressure in such a small space. So it's not nice because the mucosa dissects a little bit from the, the seat here. There's some dissection of the mucosa. It's peeled off uh, the, the bladder neck and that can cause uh, sometimes a little bit of bleeding. So I think it's better when you're going to enter the bladder, it's better to, to puncture early so the pressure is relieved and the flow of water can enter the bladder. And this will minimize the amount of uh, mucosal dissection that's going to take place. Yeah. There we are. And then uh, the bleeding coming from the mucosa will be uh, less as well. So we are progressing very nicely. My next step is going to be to try to, uh, let's say, bring the bladder neck downwards towards the posterior aspect. But for that, we have to release some of the lateral, lateral lobe. It's still, there's bladder neck, you see. I'm trying to tap it to come uh, towards the sides of the middle lobe. Huh? The middle lobe is sitting on the middle, and we're coming uh, at the lateral aspect of the middle lobe. Here, okay. that's the bladder. Huh? And this is the UO. You see, it's very, very close. Uh, now we can look at the bladder with some bleeding and we'll try to do good hemostasis so we can get a nice look at it. It's a big bladder. So remember that the UO is not very fast in here, so we will be very careful. Let's do the same job on the other side. You see that the quality of the view has fallen a little bit. Maybe due to the fact that we have uh, no longer have this small chamber that we are irrigating. So there's water going in the in the bladder and, and some blood as well. It will be a little bit difficult to That's the, this is the other side of the bladder neck. This is middle of tissue. I'm making the cut of the bladder neck, trying to follow the, let's say, circumference of, of the bladder neck. And here again, we have to be careful because the UO is likely to be very close as well. Huh? We have passed the UO medially. 
so I'm quite sure now that we won't damage it by following this this uh, dissection let's say route. Um, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Good. So this is almost done now. Just have to release the lower aspect. So for that, I'm going to try to connect, let's say, the lateral with the posterior. To see if we can take. And also remember to keep the fire, the fiber, very close to the. Uh, uh, to the adenoma, not, not to the capsule. We don't want to fire here, we want to fire up there to release the adenoma progressively without damaging the capsule uh, to a point where we can do a retrotagonal perforation. Here we are. I'm going to push the normal a little bit further up, lift it, lift it a little bit so I can expose, I can expose this, this region. That's a little bit of a normal maybe. We have to go that way. So that's the plane we have to follow. Coming up, coming up, to see if we can come out at the bladder neck uh, level. Okay. That's uh, possibly very close to the, to the bladder neck. So I was pushing a little bit with the scope to uh, generate some... The, that's the plane, there's a bleeder here, right here. Let's see if we can control it. See, Moses is very good for hemostasis. Um, even when there is a, let's say, pumping bleeder, we can usually control it uh, rather easily. And this is one of the advantages over the low power uh, lasers, I think. To struggle much more to, to coagulate pumping vessels with low power. You yeah. have to be careful here because the UR should be close. And on the other side, we could see that we were more medial than the UO, but here, yeah, here we are. So we're right at the edge. So I'm going to keep my incision at the bladder neck a little bit more medial to make sure that we don't uh, damage the UO. Here we are. Let's see if we managed uh, our objective. I'm going in to check the position of the UO here. It's quite safe. And now we have taken the battlefield a little bit more medial. So we can release this uh, tissue without uh, damaging the UO. Uh, then to meet the other side, I think we are now in a position to try to tilt the adenoma into the bladder just uh, by pushing it carefully, uh, that's the prosthetic urethra. You see this slope was almost wanting to go in, but many times it's, this, this possibility is limited by the remaining attachments at six o'clock. Uh, if the pedicle is very wide, sometimes it's difficult to push the anoma in the bladder, so it's, it's nice to, to, let's say, make it less wide, uh, to catch the attachment at six o'clock towards the midline. So the hinge, that the prostate will use to, to rotate is much smaller. And you see now we managed to push one lobe in the bladder and now the other lobe. Uh, so the prostate has flipped uh, completely. You can see that, yeah, it has flipped. It's quite big, but here we have the, the bladder neck attachment that we're going to, and, and notice that I have placed my fiber at six o'clock. Then we will. Minor million. 
you know, it's completely free, huh? And uh, this is a prosthetic fossa, and that is the sphincter, huh? That is the sphincter. So let's check uh, hemostasis for a moment. Quanto tempo hemos tardado? Salva, salva. So this, uh, for a big prostate, was possibly a very, very fast uh, nucleation time. My nurse is telling me that uh, it was about 15 minutes. And I'm going to check the quality of hemostasis. Usually with monsters, we get very good hemostasis as we go. Maybe I went a little bit fast. Didn't pay any attention to hemostasis throughout the procedure. And now I have to spend a little bit more time doing it. Yeah? So you have to find the balance between speed of dissection and quality of hemostasis. And not always we get it right. Yeah? Sometimes we go too fast. Of course, we want to go fast in the sense that we don't want to lose our time. So if we can do this operation in half an hour, I think it's better for, for the patient. Uh, we do shorter procedure, shorter urethral, so stress uh, time. We saw that you are quite pretty sure it's safe. Yeah, and here it is, I think. This is the you are. What is it? Here, huh? That's the UO. So it looks like an opening, but it's just an artifact. It's important to coagulate the vessels at the level of the bladder neck. Sometimes this is where bleeding can happen. Sometimes with the water inflow, they look towards the bladder and you don't see them very well, so you have to get to the edge. You see, like this, to, to, to spot them. It's usually minimal bleeding, but it could compromise uh, the morselation. So there we are. Okay. Let's see anteriorly. Maybe there is some anterior bleeder that it's uh, making our life a little bit less easy. But it's, it's quite difficult to reach up there. There's definitely some vessel here. So if we can control it, I think it's a good thing. Swimming. And, uh, and, you know, some minutes of anesthesis will give you a much better visibility throughout uh, the morselation phase. There's still something bleeding at the apex. Nothing really relevant. Here I'm using the, let's say, full power. Because, of course, the tissue effect depends not only on the power, but also on the uh, working distance. So you can tailor the effect where you want. So my feeling is I'm going a little bit faster. Ah. Here, for example, I will use the coagulation as I'm much closer to the anterior sphincter. It's another a small bleeder. Here we are. That will fall off on its own, and, or I will trim it, just to let it go, and let's see if we can establish a good of process to proceed to most of There we are, ah, now I think we have an overall much better vision, which is good. Now, it's uh, still from bleeding. It's okay. okay, so let's do the ultrasound. Here again. Okay, venga, congele primero y ahora imprima eso. Cambie, por favor. 
you're checking the transverse and uh, AP and your posterior uh, longitudinal view of the ultrasound. It's very impressive. The white cavity we have generated, and now we're going to take out the fiber, uh, place the laser on standby. You can see the, the prostate or the anoma feeling the, the bladder almost. Huh? Okay. I'm sorry. Bien. Okay. Esto. There we are. We are inside again. This is the nephroscope that I use for mausolation. I'm going to put my my blade near the ladder neck, but I'm going to bring it up so I am in a fixed uh, position, trying to look for the uh, Keep under the anoma and uh, morselets. Huh? I want to push the anoma a little bit, so we push the blade a little bit inside. Interestingly, this blade has no logo. Huh? And uh, if if I keep the blade in this uh, distance from the telescope, I can have some uh, information of. Uh, where is the bladder? You see, I don't see it in detail, but I can see that the color of the water uh, on the sides of the ladder is a little bit black, which means that there's no uh, bladder tissue nearby. The Piranha morselator has changed very deeply what we do, in the sense that before, sometimes morselation would take uh, longer than the mostly the nucleation phase and now it tends to be very fast because it uh, this most later choose the tissue at uh, a rate uh, of 10 or 11 grams per minute we are uh, working today we have a session with five cases we started at 3.30 and we hope to be finishing by 6.30. So typically we can do five cases in six hours. Of course, we need a very good teamwork and the collaboration of the, the operating theater personnel. The water is not so good. No, no, I can't buy one. Maybe I'm seeing that the bags, the bags are not uh, full. And I'm telling my people to check, keep an eye on the irrigation bags. I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to be without inflow. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> sometimes uh, I don't use a second irrigation. Some people use a second irrigation because they feel that the inflow is better and they feel more safe having a second irrigation. But with the Wolf system, what I have seen is that the amount of uh, water coming in and the water coming out with morselation is quite balanced. So the bladder keeps extended throughout the procedure. The only thing you have to keep, into, to keep in mind is to check that the morselation is efficient. You see, when morselation is efficient, the mouth of the blade is covered by tissue. So there will be a lot of tissue coming out and a reasonable amount of water. Whereas if we have an inefficient morselation, there will be a lot of suction of water and the bladder can empty. If the bladder empties, there's a chance to catch the bladder with the morselator and uh, produce a bladder mucosal lesion. Uh, so that's why it's important to, to keep, uh, let's say, checking. Uh, morselation is an active uh, situation where your brain has to be working you have to pay attention to detail uh, to make sure that no accident happens uh, we do 80 90 uh, cases per month and we rarely 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 see an accident of morselation typically if you can uh, let's say follow the, the rules of morselation safety rules of oscillation, it's quite unusual that you will uh, cause any damage.
But of course you need the help of the people in the operating room to check an eye on the water. You're looking at the screen, be looking after the water. So it's a complete efficient teamwork that uh, makes this procedure a success. Here you can see the piranha in action. The dish is coming out really fast and I can do continuous morselation. You know, one of the drawbacks of the piranha is that uh, the standard uh, bottles that uh, collect the water are a little bit small, they are three liters. So when you have uh, finished the bottle, you have to stop the morselation, you have to change the bottle, you have to generate vacuum again, and then you have to start again. But we found that there's bigger bottles in the market. So we use a five liter bottle. It gives us an extra, let's say, uh, amount of time that we can keep on morselating. And uh, nowadays, most of these glands, even when they're quite big, can be, uh, let's say, performed with one uh, bottle only. Uh, so in this case, there's only a small remnant left. We need to check, check the bladder, check the fossa to see that there's no, no significant amount of uh, tissue or tissue fragment. That's a small tissue fragment. And there we go. I think we finished. Next, let's put a catheter. Typically, when you can do the, the morselation with good visibility throughout, uh, there's not important bleeding from the fossa, so I can safely put the catheter in and the hemostasis will be perfect. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry.